Hey, this is Joe, and thanks for coming back for another video. In this video, we're going to talk about uh, bonding and this peanut butter thing that's been going around. Uh, I see a lot of media posts and a lot of people making comments and uh, like they're rolling their eyes about peanut butter. So we got to talk about this. What you see here on the screen is a uh, very popular epoxy-based system. It's uh, from a company called West System. Uh, they are they make epoxy that is used primarily in the marine uh, industry, a uh, boat building, surfboard building, uh, kayaks, etc., etc., etc. So we're going to talk about uh, how to use a liquid epoxy as opposed to a prepreg in this particular situation. What involves mixing epoxy? in the proper way. I've included uh, the user manual for the West System uh, Oxy Resin, uh, which is based on the 105 epoxy base. And then you use a variety of different hardeners when you're working with the epoxy system. Uh, this is the user manual. I'll put a link in the description section of this video. It's very common in the uh, composites industry to take epoxy and mix it up with different fillers for different types of operations. As you see here on the screen, we have our base uh, epoxy, which is called uh, 105. And then you have your metering uh, pumps to measure out the epoxy. You then have a series of different hardeners. You have a fast hardener, a slow hardener, an extra slow harder, hardener, sorry, and you have a special clear hardener for working with uh, like fine wood finishes, countertops, things like that. And then you have a whole range of different types of fillers. And we'll talk about, and I'll show you a chart on what you can use these different fillers for. Here we have a table that specifies different types of fillers, some operations that they are best suited for. For example, uh, here across, across the top you have the type of uh, filler and down the side you have uh, which properties you're interested in. For example, and, and we have a rating system here on number of stars. Four is the, uh, is the best application and no star is uh, uh, not good or not recommended. So let's talk about this peanut butter thing. Everyone has heard uh, Stockton Rush refer to peanut butter and uh, uh, I guess they look at it as a, a negative connotation. Someone is uh, using peanut butter when they're uh, working with epoxy. But actually, again, in the industry, you mix epoxy and fillers with different thicknesses or consistency depending upon the application that you're doing. And what better way to relate that to someone, to relate it to a, a food product that everyone is familiar with? How many people, when you say peanut butter, you, you think instantly of how thick it is and how hard it is, let's say, to stir. And that's exactly why uh, these charts and in the industry, people refer to things uh, as a food product because it is... Everyone knows how thick peanut butter is. So we have some terms here. We have uh, syrup, which is an unthickened or referred to as neat. We have a slightly thickened epoxy, let's say, which is referred to as ketchup. A moderately thickened, which is mayonnaise. And maximum thickness, which of course is our famous peanut butter. Again, these are... These terms are related to thickness, and everyone knows how thick syrup, ketchup, mayonnaise, and peanut butter. And as you know here, or as you can see here, we're moving from thin to thick. So that is where the dreaded peanut butter terminology comes into play. And yes, it's a fairly technical and very commonly used in the industry. It, it's not it doesn't have a negative connotation in the structural capability of the epoxy. Uh, so again, that's why you hear a lot of people in Stockton Rush 
uh, included makes reference to an adhesive with a peanut butter consistency. Let's talk a little bit about bonding and end caps now. Uh, I'm at the Blue Robotics site. For those of you that didn't hear the earlier video, Blue Robotics is a California-based company that makes ROVs and ROV components. Uh, ROV is remotely operated vehicle, usually in the realm of underwater. So what we have here is they sell a variety of parts. They sell uh, tubes and they sell end caps and you would put your uh, cameras and electronics components, sensors, etc. Uh, in these tubes and then you could uh, uh, create your either create your own ROV or you can purchase an ROV but uh, we're going to be talking about just the end caps here I'm looking at uh, an end cap they they sell them in various sizes you can get uh, two inch uh, four up to four inch and the smaller size and then they have some end caps up to eight inches that four inches would be a hundred millimeters the depth rating on these, uh, they have uh, several different materials. They have uh, an acrylic blank or an optical clear dome, and these are rated at 500 meters. 500 meters is 1,640 feet, and that's underwater. Uh, your aluminum or aluminum, uh, they are rated up to 950 meters. That's... Uh, 3,117 feet underwater. Now, how are these uh, end caps connected to the tubes? They're using, uh, very simply, two O-rings to fit on the end cap, and then the end cap slides into the tube. Let's go down and take a look at some drawings here. Over here on the left would be uh, a side view or profile view of the tube. And then here's your end cap with the grooves. There's a locking, a locking uh, groove here that uh, allows you to lock that in. But the seal itself is performed by simply two O-rings. And again, on uh, the aluminum or aluminum end cap, you can go down to uh, 3,117 feet. That's pretty amazing. Let's now look at some possible force that could be exhibited on the sub at depth. What we have here is a, a cylinder surface area calculator. In order to calculate the uh, force applied to the end caps on the sub, first of all, we have to know what the surface area is. I made a couple mistakes. Uh, I was assuming based on some information that an engineer gave me that the sub was uh, five feet, 10 inches in outside diameter. That apparently is incorrect. Apparently, uh, based on a Wikipedia entry, the pressure hole or pressure vessel on the Titan was 66 inches on the outside diameter and 56 inches on the inside diameter. So let's go ahead and do some calculations based on that Wikipedia entry. First of all, this calculator is asking for a radius. So radius is 33 inches and we are working in inches we aren't working in SI units and then of course the height of the end cap that we're working and if you go back and look at the image of as they're bonding the uh, flange to the carbon fiber you'll notice that they've put some epoxy around the outside of the carbon fiber up near the top so I'm guesstimating that that's going to be about three inches I've had some people calculate just the face surface area but we're going to also include that three inches around the outside perimeter of uh, the carbon fiber so what we get here in the calculation we get a surface area in square inches of 74.65 and that's rounded up to make it easy so now let's go over to a pressure area and force calculator we're approximating that the depth of the sub was right around 5,800 PSI. And again, that's right around 12, five to 13,000 feet. The area, we just calculated that and that's 7465. That gives us a force of uh, 43 million pound feet. So that's a tremendous amount of force. 
let's talk about some things about what actually is holding those end caps on the uh, pressure vessel. And it looks like, uh, and this is again, this isn't a thin walled vessel. Uh, this is a thick walled vessel. So there's a lot more stresses involved and coming at different angles compared to a thin walled vessel. So again, I'm not an engineer. But let's make this a collaborative effort get some engineers involved to help us out with these calculations here. We could theoretically say that the end caps are being held on to the carbon fiber by the intense pressure of the ocean depth. And we might even want to theorize that the epoxy bonding is this just there as a gasket or to hold the end caps on at surface level pressure uh, again we might want to get some engineers to to make some comments on that but in looking at the information that I showed you with the uh, uh, blue robotics uh, those end caps are are in place with o-rings and the pressure surrounding those end caps are holding uh, those end caps on at depth now let's talk about some uh, theories that some other people have made if you look at the recovery images, you'll notice when they lifted the hemispheres out of the water or off the ship and put them on the dock, you'll notice that the uh, acrylic viewing window and the flange that holds that window in place uh, were missing. You can also notice that on the hemisphere, the titanium hemisphere, there were no bolts around the outside of that uh, hemisphere that, it, that were bolted to the uh, titanium flange. Now, a couple things could occur. The ROV that was lifting those flanges and hemisphere end caps up might not have had the weight capacity to lift those up. So they may have had to unbolt those. We don't know. We'll probably know later when they produce the fact-finding engineering results, but that could be a possibility. Uh, to get that loop through that titanium end cap, they may have had to remove the uh, acrylic window or what was left of the acrylic window if it imploded in order to get to lift that up to the surface. Again, we don't know. Some other people have made the uh, comment that when the carbon fiber failed, instead of blowing those flanges and hemispheres out, that instead, because of the surrounding pressure at depth, those hemispheres then would have collapsed inward. And I'm not saying that's not possible. We don't know, or at least I don't know. Maybe we can get some, again, some engineers to comment on that. If the end caps were pressed inwards as a result of the carbon fiber failing, then would that be enough pressure to blow all those bolts off as opposed to the ocean pressure coming in and blowing the end caps off? Again, I can't answer that. I don't know. We don't know uh, all of the facts. Again, they could have unbolted everything to lift it up to the surface because those ROVs are limited in the amount of weight that they can carry. So we'll have to wait for the, uh, the results from the Canadian NTSB. I also want to discuss some errors that I made in the previous video. In the recovery images, I was accidentally pointing to the upper surface here. This is the surface. If you look very closely, you can see the bolt holes that the hemispherical end caps bolted into. Uh, in actual fact, the bonding area is at the bottom. So that is a mistake that I made. I was looking at this uh, flange differently. So I wanted to correct my error and that. If you look here, you can actually see the epoxy adhesive on the inside. And if you notice, on the portion of the U part of the flange here, the epoxy go goes down around the edges. If you also look at the edge of the carbon fiber, again, this is where I'm getting that three inch measurement. This flange, when, it, when dropped into place, overlaps the outer portion of the carbon fiber. Another error that I made was in the calculations of how much PSI is being applied to the area of bonding uh, and the adhesive around the flange and 
the outer portion here of the carbon fiber. I said that it was uh, like right around 9,000 PSI. And, and based on some discussions I've had with some engineers, I was in an incorrect in that assumption. There's some uh, complex calculations based on the surface area of the flange and the amount of pressure that is pushing down on the, the hemispherical end caps onto this flange. And the bonding air area here being much smaller in surface area than the, f than the actual covers or end caps or the hemispherical end caps, the pressures here in PSI are much higher. Now I am working with some engineers to try to come up with some calculations for this. Because this is not a thin walled cylinder, this is a thick walled cylinder. Some of the, comp some of the uh, calculations are very complex because you're getting different pressures at different points because this is a thick walled cylinder. So there could be some shear values involved in addition to compressive values. So again, I don't have the capability of calculating that myself. I'm working on learning some of these things, but we're going to have to depend on some engineers to assist us with that. So I'm working with a, a group of engineers on an engineering forum out on the web. Um, hopefully they can come up with some calculations for me. They indicated because it's a thick walled cylinder that some of the calculations are quite complex. If any engineers out there want to assist, let me know. I'll give you all the specifications on the measurements. And uh, then uh, when you calculate that, we can publish all this information so that everyone can see what those values are. So at this point, uh, I'd like to thank everyone for all their great comments for watching the video. Stay tuned. Uh, next video we're going to talk about, is it possible to build a carbon fiber pressure vessel? to be successful and to last repeated dives at depth. And I found a company out there that is actually doing that. So we'll see you next time.